How's it going guys? This is Jeff Benjamin with 9 to Vi Mac. This is episode number three of Back to the Mac. Please excuse my voice. I am battling a really severe cold, 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 cold. I know you guys are gonna make fun of me for the way I pronounce that. I'm entitling this episode Back to the Pro and I'm specifically focusing on the MacBook Pro because most of us can acknowledge that the MacBook Pro has seen better days. As of late, the MacBook Pro isn't so pro anymore. And I just wanna preface this by saying this is not some angry YouTube rant. This is not an indictment against Apple's design team. I respect Apple's design team. I think they work hard. Their engineers obviously work hard, uh, but let's just be honest. The Pro and the MacBook Pro isn't really living up to what it should live up to. So I've identified several different areas where Apple could improve the MacBook Pro. Now, some of these areas are just simply going back to how they used to do things. In my neck of the woods, we call that backtracking. But other things are just genuine enhancements that I would like to see. I think the MacBook Pro is a good machine, but I do think that it doesn't serve its customers as well as it used to in the past. So we're gonna talk about that on this serious episode of Back to the Mac. The number one problem that Apple needs to address with the MacBook Pro is one that I think most people will agree with, and that is the keyboard. I don't like to use hyperbole. Come on, it's Jeff. Of course I like to use hyperbole. This is a terrible keyboard. And not only is it terrible from just a, a key travel perspective, but it's also terrible as far as reliability is concerned. You would not believe how many people I have talked to who have had problems with their MacBook Pro keyboard. This is the thing that you need the most on a, on a computer, the thing you type with. Of all things, that should be the thing that you, that you don't make compromises with because that is what people need to get work done. I appreciate the innovation behind it, like with the butterfly switches and things of that nature, I do appreciate the innovation and appreciate the hard work that obviously went in to making this a reality. However, please let's just call a spade a spade and let's acknowledge that this was a bad design decision and it needs to be scrapped for something better. The second thing I like to see is to bring back the SD card uh, because that too, I believe, was a mistake. And I even defended Apple's decision to do this, saying that, hey, it was the camera manufacturers. They, they are the ones that should you know, improve their technology and, and come up to speed with things like USB 3 and USB Type-C. That is true. However, that was very short-sighted on my behalf. After actually using the computer and working with video and photos and working with SD cards, Yes, it is so beneficial to have a built-in SD card slot on the MacBook Pro, and the MacBook Pro needs one. Because unlike other peripherals where the manufacturers of those peripherals could technically make a USB Type-C input for those, the SD card is just an SD card. It, it needs either an adapter or it needs a place to put it on the MacBook Pro, to insert it on the MacBook Pro. So to me, having an SD card slot, preferably UHS-2 SD card slot on the MacBook Pro, is more important than bringing back the legacy USB type A ports, for instance. So please Apple, with regard to IO, if you don't bring anything else back, please bring back the SD card slot. Preferably UHS-2, please. Now who wouldn't want more RAM in their MacBook Pro? Everyone wants that. The problem with that is, is that Intel's latest 8th gen chips, for instance, still only support LPDDR3, which is limited. It's capped at 16 gigabytes. So, Apple is going to want to continue to use the low power version of RAM. Uh, they're not gonna to wanna to put DDR4 in a MacBook Pro due to its power requirements. So you're still gonna be capped at 16 gigabytes of RAM for the foreseeable future. However, that doesn't make it any less relevant to put on this list of things that we want. We still want 32 gigabytes of RAM in a MacBook Pro. Hopefully that will come sooner than later. I love the fact that I can buy a laptop today that's thinner than a thin crust pizza that I can use and edit videos with Final Cut Pro 10. However, that should not be the MacBook Pro. That should be the 12 inch MacBook. The MacBook Pro should be thick enough to house a battery that gives you even better battery life. I know that's not Apple's way of doing things, but that is why you have a Pro model. Uh, that is why you have a MacBook Pro and why you have a regular MacBook. That is why we've seen the iPhone, uh, in some cases, get a little thicker at times, or the iPad, get a little thicker at times. It's okay to be a little thicker 
for the sake of battery life. In the age of 4K, 5K, 8K, let's up the resolution, okay? That was super, I apologize for that. That was really, and while we're at it, let's go ahead and add a matte screen option like we used to have back in the day. Now, this is something that Apple says is coming this spring, better external GPU support. I really want Apple to focus on giving us better external GPU support, and hopefully that will come this spring. I want our MacBook Pros to really start to utilize the Thunderbolt 3 IO it has at its disposal. I want us to be able to purchase an external GPU box, plug it in, have it work reliably, and not just that, I want it to be able to power the internal display of the MacBook Pro. Hopefully that will come this spring, we will see, but I think that is a must for Pro users who demand more for their VR development, for editing videos. It also plays right into Apple's uh, design language, allowing them to keep the MacBook Pro very thin, yet still having access to all that extra power on demand when needed. And here's something that may prove to be controversial to some of you. I know some of you love the touch bar. I personally don't like the touch bar. I know a lot of people who don't like the touch bar. I don't think it has been a success at all. I think it's a relatively forgotten thing. Uh, I think that Apple obviously worked very hard on making the touch bar what it is. Uh, the developers, the engineers did a very good job of uh, making the touch bar, developing the touch bar, but I just don't think it's a feature that people need. I don't think it was a feature that people were asking for. I don't think developers are overly excited about it. Some of them do it very well. Like you think about DJ, uh, the DJing app. I think that's done very well. Some other apps are done very well with the touch bar, but I think by and large, it's been a disappointment. The main issue with the touch bar is that there's no tactile feedback whatsoever. No one wants to look at their keyboard screen. No one wants to look at the keyboard while they type. That's a very inefficient way to go about doing things. I think enough time has passed to call the touch bar what it is, an interesting concept, but just not something that's very useful in day-to-day -day professional workflows or even just regular workflows. Now, I understand that there are some touch bar fans out there and that's okay. And I think it's okay to try things, but also it should be okay to say, hey, it didn't work out, let's move on. And I think that's what Apple should do. And I know some of you are gonna say, hey, but what about Touch ID? Because that's really useful. And I agree, that is really useful. But you know what's even more useful? Face ID. And that's my final item on today's wish list. Face ID in the Mac seem like a perfect match. It would make authenticating on your Mac so much easier. And I think it's a no brainer that we see Face ID on the MacBook Pro. So ladies and gentlemen, that has been my list of items that I think would make the MacBook Pro a better machine. What do you guys think? Do you agree? Do you disagree with anything on my wish list? Let me know down below in the comments. Thumbs up if you agree with what I say. Thumbs down if you don't agree. So there hasn't been a ton of Mac-centric news to report, but there have been a couple of stories that I'd like to highlight right now. The first one is our review of the CalDigit TS3+. Plus. Now, this is a Thunderbolt 3 enabled dock, and I called it the best Thunderbolt 3 enabled dock for the Mac for a number of reasons. Number one, it provides 85 watts of power delivery to a MacBook Pro. So you're gonna be able to recharge a 15 inch MacBook Pro at full speed. Number two, it has 15 different ports, including an SD card front facing port, which is UHS-2 compatible, which is nice. And then there's also USB 3.1 Gen 2 support as well. So check that out. One of the best, if not the best docs available for the Mac right now. Our next piece of news is that Apple has released the second developer beta of Mac OS High Sierra 10.13.4. Of course, the first beta brought about some interesting new eGPU changes. So we continue to monitor these beta releases for eGPU enhancements. And then lastly, unless you were living under a rock, you know the HomePod launched this past Friday. Uh, we've had tons of coverage here on 9to5Mac about the HomePod, including a couple of videos as well. Uh, but one of the things that people have complained about that isn't there on day one is stereo pairing. Stereo pairing is not enabled because AirPlay 2 has not yet launched. Um, that should be launching soon, but in the meantime, there is a way that you can get a pseudo stereo pair right now using Airfoil, which is a Mac utility. So check out that post on how to use Airfoil to create a stereo HomePod pair right now. 
So that is this week's news. Of course, there isn't a whole bunch, but hopefully next week will bring a lot more. So on this week's unboxing, it's kind of obvious before I even open the box, thanks to the tape, the Synology branded blue tape there. Um, this is obviously a Synology NAS, but there is one special thing about this NAS that I want to highlight in particular. So let's go ahead and unbox it here and we'll just flip it over. All right, so there it is, the Synology Disk Station 1817. Yeah, so why is this such a big deal? Well, obviously it has eight different bays, so you can have a whole bunch of storage in this thing, uh, tons of storage available. Uh, but the real thing that stands out to me is that this has four ethernet ports on it. And let's turn it around so I can show you those four ethernet ports. Okay, so four ethernet ports, but the thing that's really special is that the top two are 10 gigabit ethernet ports. That's obviously going to play very nice with the iMac Pro. So we'll have more coverage of the Synology DS1817 in the near future. Stay tuned. So our giveaway winner for this week is Nick Bird. Congratulations, Nick. You've won a copy of Affinity Photo for Mac, and you've also won the Affinity Photo Workbook. But of course, we have another giveaway in the works. We've again partnered with Serif. This time, we're gonna give away the companion app, Affinity Designer. Now, with Affinity Photo being compared to Photoshop, Affinity Designer is comparable to Adobe Illustrator. So if you wanna step your illustration game up, make sure you enter to win. Again, super simple, super easy. We're not gonna make this real difficult, partly for my benefit, so I don't have to go through a whole bunch of steps to find the winner. All you need to do is follow us on Instagram at 9 to 5 mac like the post related to Back to the Mac episode three, and leave a comment as to why you want to win. So we have two questions this week. Number one comes from Stevens288. He asks, Jeff, what do you use for a to-do list app on Mac? I prefer Things 3 because I already use it on the iPhone and it's excellent there. So I tried it on the Mac and you know what? It's excellent there as well. Highly recommend Things 3 if you're looking for a to-do app. And then our next and final question because you guys just don't care to ask me anything. And then our next and final question is from Daniel Clayton. He asks, so you're not a left docker anymore? Now I know some of you are confused about what he means by being a left docker. Basically what Daniel was saying is that I like to keep the dock, the macOS dock on the left side of the screen. Left, left, left side of the screen. Um, because it allows you to have more vertical real estate because the dock isn't taking up precious vertical real estate. There's more horizontal real estate than there is vertical real estate on a typical 16 by nine screen. Hence, my theory is that having the dock positioned on the left side of the screen is actually better, uh, a more efficient use of space. So that's what he means. Now, Clayton, I admit, I haven't been using my left dock setup lately because I've been using a dual screen setup from time to time. And as you know, dual screen setups don't really work all that well. You can make it work, but depending on how you have it configured, they don't really work all that well with docks on the left or right side of the screen. It's better if you have them at the bottom uh, in most cases. So that is why I am no longer a left dock user, at least for the time being. But I still firmly believe that the left dock is the best dock. So ladies and gentlemen, again, you made it to the end of the episode. Thank you for watching episode number three of Back to the Mac. That concludes this episode. Hopefully next week I'll be back with a mended voice and I will be back to normal in that regard. If you appreciated this episode, please leave me a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, you can also leave me a thumbs down. Hopefully you liked it though. Uh, and also please subscribe so that you're updated when new videos are posted. And as always, let me know what you guys think down below in the comment section. This is Jeff with 9to5Mac.